for starters, uh, it'd be great if you could uh, introduce yourself for the for the audience and uh, and tell a little bit about uh, about your role. Um, real quick, I, I'll just uh, center, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Spaceback. And uh, when Lauren and I, uh, when Lauren paired Kate and I for for this session, uh, I'm sure she didn't already know this, but uh, we're actually partners too. Um, so we're working together and providing creative for uh, for Jameson brand. Um, we've worked together for Glenn Levitt uh, in the past as well, um, where where our software recreates uh, the social media experiences and uh, all of their brands that have such strong presence on on Instagram and Facebook and in social environments. Um, and, and so we're recreating those in ad units. So uh, that's not the point of the talk today, but I just want to let everyone know, um, you know brand, it's, it's just cool to, to be working together uh, in the brand innovators community. And um, I, I know Lauren probably didn't, didn't even know about that. Um, but uh, but yeah, that, that's exciting. Um, but Kate, I'll, I'll let you uh, kick off um, introducing yourself and your role, which which I think is the coolest title I've ever heard. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a great coincidence that um, that we were already working together as companies, and you know that also segues into um, you know what I love, which is like building those relationships and those partnerships between like-minded companies. So um, I do think that I have one of the coolest jobs in the world. Um, I am the director of new business development. Um, I've been at Pernover Card for over nine years now, almost ten. Um, but started in the sales side. I was the director of. I managed New York for the wine and champagne team for a few years. Segued into marketing, and about four years ago, I started up this new division within Perno, which is the new business development team. And what I love about Pernover Card is really their belief in entrepreneurship and so when i had this idea originally to start up this division you know at most companies when you're sitting with your boss and they're like what is your next job going to be within your career at the company you know usually you pick from a list of you know predefined roles and you know my boss really at the time really encouraged me to um you know explore other opportunities and think about what was missing at print over card and how i could kind of build that. And one thing, you know, in my role in marketing, I was focused on uh, luxury prestige, as we called it. And we would work with a lot of different luxury brands on one off events. And it was kind of just, you know, one off, you know, we'd sponsor an event here and there, or, you know, they'd purchase some products that we'd help fulfill. And then they would go on with another partner. And so would we and there was no long term vision there. And so when I started up this team, I was really looking to find long term symbiotic partnerships. So it doesn't mean that it's a, a long term sponsorship, but it's really beyond that and looking for like minded companies that have like either the same similar brand pillars or a similar consumer target and look for ways to work together that we can be an asset to each other. So this kind of spans to many many different industries from fashion to jewelry finance um, we work with some banks uh like um benjamin from the previous um the previous call and um and then tech and entertainment as well and how we work with each of them is different too Cool. Yeah. And, and it seems like um, there's all kinds of different, I mean, being, you know, alcohol, a lot of different brands that, that you can uh, do, do events with and, and people like to drink uh, pretty much all, all types of events. So that's uh, the great so part is that everyone wants to work with us. <laughs> everyone needs wine, spirits or champagne for their events. So that makes it easier. Yeah. And, and ironically, even though we're not not having in person events, it seems like uh, Americans are drinking uh, even more than than ever before. Um, so maybe a quick, quick icebreaker. What are you drinking right now? So I would have to say in the beginning of COVID, I was um, focused more on the, the warmer beverages because it was cold. So I was drinking Glenlivet hot toddies. That was kind of like my my five o'clock um, cocktail of choice. And then now that we got into the summer months, I'm going to my traditional drink, which is avion, reposado, soda, and three limes. So that would be like my current drink. But saying that, I, I mean, my first introduction into this industry was with champagne. So I still have like a special place in my heart for a good glass of champagne. 
And I think us as Americans, we don't drink enough champagne. You know, we we reserve it for a wedding or a really important occasion. And I think it's it's all about celebrating those everyday moments that um, I think we kind of have to, especially during this time, uh, realize all the important things like, you know, cheersing to our health or cheersing to, you know, just a good a good presentation or a good meeting. Um, you don't necessarily need it to be an epic reason. Yeah, like a good Wednesday. Totally. Yeah, right on. Um, yeah, I, I could definitely drink drink more champagne. I, I don't. I, I never really think champagne, but um, um, that, that's a good point. That it, it's internationally, are people is champagne more of a go to? Absolutely. In Europe, it's much more a part of their culture. What's interesting is um, I remember when I used to be in the sales side and calling on a lot of restaurants and hotels. I would one of the experiments I would like to do is I'd sit at the bar order a glass of champagne and just be you know, chatting to the bartender. And guaranteed every time someone would look at me and say like, oh, what are you celebrating? And I would just say, oh, life. And they would be like, wow, I love that. And a lot of times people would then start to order it. It's just one of those things that you don't think to order unless you're kind of, um, it's brought to your attention. Yeah, Cele celebrating is contagious. Um, I, I just grabbed this cause it's on my bar, but, um, I believe this is one of your emerging brands, uh, Vita, Vita Mescal. Down um, the gay, yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, my, uh, my, my partner who, who I live with, uh, wanted a margarita for her birthday and requested a Mescal margarita. Um, so, so we picked that up. Um, and it's fantastic. Um, love to, uh, um, learn a little bit more about uh you were talking about you know how you can partner with uh so many you know being a luxury brand yourself um obviously there's so many other luxury brands that you can partner with around events um it'd be great if you could share an example of of one of those partnerships and uh maybe the kind of events that you that you do that are going well before covid and then now that we are not doing as much in person how are those kind of partner partnerships um transitioning and still still able to engage audiences even though we can't all get together in person yeah, absolutely. Prior to COVID, my small team and I would do probably around 200 events or so a year, spanning most of them small, intimate luxury events. Some of them were Pernod Ricard brand focus. Others were partner events um, that we would collaborate on. And so the way that we work with, with partners is there's a lot of different ways. And it's really um, tailored to the different company and what they need from us so events is one of the the ways that we work with them as well as creating custom gifts for them collaborating on content and also collaborating on influencer programs so on the event side um after after covid like everybody else we kind of had to pivot and with all of these events you know they weren't just going away there were certain um you know, important things that were coming up, whether it was a wedding or whether it was a new watch collection launch that were still going to happen with or without COVID. So it was working with them to figure out how can we make this still happen in a really special way, but virtually. So one of the ways that we've been doing that is kind of like this event in a box concept. And so we've worked with a lot, we work with a lot of different companies that can kind of create these custom bespoke boxes um, that have all the fixings for an event. So right now we're working with a luxury watch company on a new release that they have coming up. And we're doing a, um, a kind of a whiskey and watch event. So we have one of our whiskey makers as well as them having one of their watchmakers. Everyone's receiving a box with the information on um, on the new on the new watch collection as well as a bottle of personalized engraved um, one of our whiskeys. And then there's all sorts of extra swag in the box. And so the idea is that everyone around the country will get the box on the same time, open it up on the Zoom call, and then experience a whiskey tasting that's paired with the different watches. And really utilizing like the craftsmanship between them to um, find the parallels um, within the two different industries. So that's kind of one way that we've we've made it 
kind of go in more of the virtual capacity. But prior to COVID, I mean, we did all sorts of all sorts of events from full scale New York Fashion Week events. Um, we did an amazing event with Alice and Olivia last year for New York Fashion Week, and this was total 360. We worked with them on influencers. We created a co-branded handbag. Our product it was with the Glenn Levitt, who was. Um, Glenn Levitt was actually the sponsor of New York Fashion Week. And so we blew that up and it became not just at Spring Studios, but throughout all of New York and really the country kind of felt that New York Fashion Week vibe in September. And it was everywhere. It was on buses. There was pop-up bars throughout the city. We had sip and shops um, in stores like Theory, Alice and Olivia, Versace. You know, you could walk into the store and have a have a Glen Levitt cocktail while you shopped. And with um, with Alice and Olivia within the show, Glen Levitt was um, organically every part of the way from the invitation to the actual show itself. It was really seamless um, how the brand was integrated in such a, a meaningful way. That's amazing. A major activation. It's it sounds like you know it's amazing that you and your small team are are able to uh, put put all that together. Um, do you work with a, an agency or um, or other teams externally uh, to to help you with manpower for for those kind of large activations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have um, an amazing events team within um, Printer Card as well, and so you know this was the type of event that was all hands on deck. So from the brand team to the experiential team, the digital team, our events team, as well as our team. Um, our team really has owns the relationship with a lot of these external brands. Um, but then we definitely bring in agency partners to um, help with all the logistics and execution on site. Cool. Um, and then I, I also really like the the gift uh, or sorry, the, the event in a box concept um, that you mentioned. Uh, and it's cool that that's kind of incorporating gift and an event into into one thing. Um, we've definitely noticed uh, in COVID um, that because we're not out, you know, at you know taking clients to dinner and bars and you know so able to spend as much time in person, we have been gifting more um, and and find it it almost feels like people appreciate it more more now than before. And e even like little little things like um, just sending someone a, a Free launch or um, you know a, a seamless gift card or anything. It, it seems like it's going a long way. Um, what what are you uh, kind of doing with with? I mean, the the watch example uh, is really cool. Um, are you seeing gifting? Uh, like, are are people um, sending more gifts because they're not drinking out more, or, or what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, I would say that gifting is more important than ever. You know, people want to remind their clients, their employees. That they're thinking about them um, and i think personalization has always been important especially in the luxury tier but right now it's important because you're not doing it in person you're not handing them the gift in person you're sending it to them so finding a way to personalize it either through we do a ton of custom engraving personalized custom labels even just as simple as like a handwritten note uh, it really goes a long way in terms of the, the personalization and making sure it's something that they're interested in. So if they're hugely into mixology, um, you know, we've been creating these um, these really cool mixology kits where people get all the ingredients to make a cocktail at home. This is actually something that we've been working with. Um, so a lot of the times we work with these different companies on their high net worth audience and their consumers and how they're entertaining their clients. But another thing that we've started seeing, especially during COVID, is companies wanting to entertain their own employees. And so this has been great for either an icebreaker or team building activities so that they can still feel connected when they're all sitting in their own home offices or kitchen tables. Um, so we've been doing a lot of these like mixology classes, um, especially in like the tech companies where they're trying to basically become masters in mixology by the end of COVID. And, you know, bringing a lot of education to them on, you know, the whiskey making experience, the champagne, um, you know, all of the different educational components, but then also teaching them how to make a cocktail. Very cool. 
Um, and, and one thing we talked about yesterday briefly, um, it, it sounds like uh, p- people are not only drinking more, um, you know, at, at COVID, but uh, they are drinking high end uh, and, and like and luxury brands um, uh, in particular. So uh, it would be great to get your take on, you know, what, why that is, that is the case. Um, you know, is it just because people aren't going to restaurants, so they want to have that, you know, $300 bottle of wine at, at home? Or why do you think it is? Well, I think when we first started with COVID, I think people were scared. They didn't know how long they were going to be locked up at home. And so, you know, they were stocking, they were pantry loading. So everything from the toilet paper, the paper towels, the beer, the wine, the spirits. And so we definitely saw that in the beginning, um, especially in the the still wine category and some of the the big brands. I think in the very beginning, they were going to staples, the, the power brands that had been there forever and less so on like the craft side in the very beginning. Um, and then we kind of saw people transitioning, realizing that they were going to be at home for a while, continuing to, to purchase um, a lot in the alcohol sector. But then we saw them starting to experiment. And what's interesting is you would assume that you know, still wine, boxed wine, beer um, would grow, and they have been. But um, what's interesting is that spirit brands retailing at $100 plus have actually grown in double digits um, and continue to grow faster than the total spirits market. So that's what's kind of, you wouldn't expect that during this time, you know, we're talking about a possible recession and, you know, people being careful with their money, but I think during this time, they're also being aware of the quality of what they're putting in their body and what they're, if they're going to spend their money on something, they want it to be something that's worthwhile. And so we've seen that people want to, exactly what you said about the $300 bottle that they would have had at a restaurant, now they can buy that bottle for $100 at their local wine shop and drink it at home. So they're still getting some of that experience. They don't they're not willing to totally give up on that and just eat canned tuna and, you know, cheap vodka. You know, they still want to experience the the luxuries of life and they still want to experience quality ingredients, quality cocktails and quality wine at home. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure this is something you spend a lot of time talking about with with your team. Um, but coming, uh, you know, as as we are, um, you know, getting back getting back to, you know, more, more business as usual and who knows exactly how long it's going to take, but do you think the, um, the behaviors that people are developing around, uh, like you said, double digit growth for spirits over a hundred dollars, that's, that's incredible. Um, that's, that's a lot of people drinking, drinking at home. Um, do you think the behaviors are going to, uh, change or do you think people are like adopting new behaviors that they're going to continue, um, post COVID or like, or do you, um, it's going to be back to kind of kind of numbers that you saw before COVID uh, after people are back back at events and things are going back to normal? Well, I mean, I think that there's definitely going to be some behaviors that don't go back to normal. And I think one of the things in our industry especially is e-commerce. So our industry as a whole is way behind the times in terms of digital and e-com, but the alcohol industry actually grew the fastest among all CPG in terms of e-com during this COVID period. I don't know about you, but I am addicted to Amazon and I want things like basically before I ordered them. Um, I'm used to, you know, you kind of get spoiled by the access to things. And I think that that's what we're going to continue to see is that people want that same access and quick response time that they do with their groceries, whether it's Instacart or Amazon, um, in the wine and spirit world as well. So I would say that that's something that's been a huge, huge focus for Pernod Ricard and, you know, the industry as a whole. And it's something that, you know, just in the past four months, the amount of e-com business that our industry has done has really, um, you know, it's, it's quadrupled. It's pretty incredible. And I don't see that going away. So I think people are going to definitely shop more from their phone, shop more from their from their homes and expect it to be personalized and at their door, um, you know, within hours, um, if not the next day. So I don't see that going away. I think that um, the 
going back to crafts and those, um, you know, hard to find rare items, I think that that's going to kind of continue. We've seen, you know, I just had a conversation with a auction house the other day, and they're seeing a huge uptick on their spirit auctions because people are sitting at home and, um, you know, they might not be going to the auction in person, but they're, you know, bidding on things online. And, you know, a client of mine the other day said, oh, I just got this amazing um, bottle of Glenlivet from um, Princess Diana's wedding. Um, a commemorative bottle that was created. And he's like, I'd love to do a virtual tasting with my friends and open up this bottle. So we're kind of seeing more of that, um, you know, the rarities um, really kind of, I think that's going to continue on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And one, one thing, just a clarifying question, question. Um, when, when you talk about the e-commerce business being up, uh, does it include like um, people placing an Instacart order that's like picked up from Safeway, does that count as e-commerce? Yeah, so what's interesting about our industry is we have a three-tier system. So it's unfortunate, but fortunate at the same time. So us as the, um, as the owner of the brands, we, on the spirit side specifically, we sell to a distributor who sells to a retailer who then sells to the end consumer. And so going through the e-commerce, um, e-commerce is just almost, almost like a fourth tier. So we still go through that same three tier and those third party marketplaces then utilize the um, the retailers to pick up the product and um, and deliver it. Basically, they're taking the orders on behalf of those liquor stores. Gotcha. That makes so sense. Everyone from, you know, Amazon, Instacart, Drizzly, Reserve Bar, Minibar, all of those um, type of companies work in that same capacity. Gotcha. Um, and then those types of companies, obviously, you know, they're they're seeing growth um, right right now. How closely do you work with with them um, on like promotions or events or anything like that? Is that more the distributor? Or is that something Pernod Ricard or, or your team um, would get involved with? No, absolutely. I mean, we work very very closely with these ecom partners. Um, you know, myself, my team included, as well as we have an ecom team at Perno. But, um, you know, when we're doing all these events, at the end of the day, we're going to want to see that ROI and we're going to need a place to drive those sales. And so, you know, on the spirit side, for example, they cannot place an order directly, you know, through um, Perno Ricard. All of that has to be done legally um, through the three tier system. And um, so the easiest way to do that is through e-commerce. On the wine and champagne side, on the other hand, it's a little bit more complicated because there is the DTC model. Um, and that's been on fire as well, especially on the still wine side. Gotcha. Interesting. And then um, obviously with e-commerce being up, uh, how is your relationship changing with like with Drizzly and those kind of on-demand on delivery services? Uh, are those becoming more and more important for uh, for for your team? And because um, yeah, I, I know you mentioned partnering with like a lot of luxury brands, like uh, jewelry and fashion and stuff. Um, but do you see like dis distribution being something that uh, you're you know because less physical events doing more and more with those types of partners? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, ecom partners have definitely. I mean, for my team specifically, because we work with a lot of external you know, high net worth or companies, and we need a place to kind of drive them. So e-commerce has always been some, you know, very, very important element to our business. But I, I see that only becoming more and more important down the line. I think that, um, you know, it's great to have a, a digital space that we can kind of send people to where they can experience our brands digitally, but then also, you know, make that purchase. Um, cool. And I, uh, I have a few uh, questions that have come in from, from the audience. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a, a few of those, uh, real quick. Um, so, uh, some interest in, um, in how, how do you see your audience demographic, uh, to be, uh, to be expanded, to be more inclusive, um, as the industry grows and, and evolves? Um, uh, is that something you're, you're, how do you see it becoming more inclusive over time? So, I mean, I think that our audience, I mean, obviously each one of our brands, what's cool about Pernod Ricard is that we have something in every category from still wine, champagne, 
cognac, tequila, vodka, and also at a variety of different price points. So, I mean, we're pretty much the only company that has something in every category. So we kind of span all, we're very inclusive. Um, I think we have something for, for everyone, no matter what your price point is, what your taste preference is, whether you like imported or, um, you know, domestic wines. And so we try and, um, you know, all of our brands try and be very inclusive because, you know, it's not, I think like the old day thinking of like scotch is for like, you know, old, you know, old guys that are, are drinking it with a cigar. It's definitely not like that anymore. And I think that, um, you know, as people are trying to experiment and try new things, I think we're trying to do the same thing on the brand side too, is say like, no, I mean, Glenn Livet actually did an amazing job of this because, you know, single malts was very traditional. That's what they thought of. It was an old, old white guy's drink kind of thing. And Glenn Livet was, did an amazing campaign where they're like, no, you know, yeah. we don't have to make a separate product for women or for, you know, the Glenn Livet brand is for everybody. And you know, that sponsorship that they did with the New York Fashion Week, a lot of people were super surprised that a single malt scotch would do something like that that was so, um, you know, diverse and also female kind of focused. But mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, we need to see more of that, of brands kind of saying like, no, we're not for a specific type of person. It's for anybody that enjoys that type of product. Yeah, right on. And you noticed that um, when we were activating the creative for for the Glenn Levitt uh, in, in space back and, and, um, and, and for Jameson as well, but um, all of the social media content that you're creating is very inclusive. And I think it does challenge like a lot of the, uh, Kind of, kind of. I mean, like you said, like people think, you know, it's an old, uh, old white guy smoking a cigar, drinking a single malt, malt scotch in his library, uh, and and really, um, I, I think a lot of the content coming out um, was more uh, a, a whole lot more inclusive. And then because you're able to use the social media content in in other environments too, I think it further does break down a barrier and feel more 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 engaging and uh, and inviting for for anyone to to participate with the brand. Um, it, it all comes back to, you know, our whole values at Pernod Ricard is all about conviviality and, you know, our founder in every meeting, it always comes back to our founder saying, make a new friend every day. And I think that's the most important thing is it's making a friend and seeing someone and, you know, sharing in those convivial moments that can be done with, with our products. And our new CEO, um, Anne, has, is just continuing to push the boundaries and be more inclusive and diverse. And, um, you know, I'm really proud of, you know, where we're going with, with all of our brands. Yeah, awesome. Um, another question uh, from, from the audience. Um, what, what has been your most successful marketing campaign that you've, done, that you've worked on? Most successful marketing campaign. Um, I think that, um, I don't know about the most successful. I mean, we've done so many different things over the years, but um, not to go back to this again, but I think that the, you know, being a part of the, the New York Fashion Week event last year, I think was pretty amazing at um, blowing it out 360. But I, I also want to say like, right now when it's kind of like getting back to the basics and just, um, you know, focusing on the relationships and, you know, how we can be an asset to our different partners, especially during this time, a lot of the industries are, you know, having a really tough time right now and figuring out ways to be creative. And I mean, that's my favorite part is the brainstorming and it's the, you know, how can we, how can we, we were all excited about this huge activation that was going to happen that's no longer happening. How can we make it that much better and something we can still be proud and excited about? So I think some of these virtual experiences that we're doing, um, we just did one with Water for Crystal a couple weeks ago, where it was one of their glass blowers with um, one of our global champagne ambassadors and talking about you know, how different champagnes taste differently in different crystal cut glasses. 
And, you know, just showing the parallels of the diamond cut champagne with the crystal, the crystal cut um, glasses, it was pretty cool. And I think that it was such a cool experience for everyone on the on the Zoom. You know, they all had their their Waterford crystal. They all had their three marks of Perry Jouet. And I think it's, you know, it's those simple things, the back to the basics. Um, but it's kind of being creative in these times that kind of gets me most excited and proud now. Cool. That is, that is so cool. Um, and yeah, it's just amazing. I'm, I'm so impressed um, that, uh, I mean, even the brand innovators community uh, is really thriving, um, even though we can't get together in person. And it sounds like uh, you've been very quick to to roll out creative events that can get people to participate from, you know, their their office or, or home office or, or wherever, wherever they are. Um, and I, I think it's fascinating about the um, how different kind of glasses, uh, I guess, like champagne bubbles, um, like rise differently in different type of glasses. Is that what the, the class was about? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely part of it. But it's it's amazing just like a regular glass versus crystal versus plastic, um, you know, how things taste differently um, in and the material and the craftsmanship and what a difference that makes in how you're enjoying it. So, um, you know, that was just like one of the one of the ideas of ways that we could bring content and education to, you know, both their consumers and our consumers. But we're always trying to find fun ways to kind of collaborate with different brands. That's awesome. Cool. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, some, someone asked around um, how, uh, so what, what trends in consumer behavior are particularly uh, important to you um, and how are those changing? And we touched on that a little bit, but I, I wanna make sure I'm not leaving anyone's questions behind. Yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, right now with the hospitality industry, um, you know, it's unfortunate everything that's going on right now with, um, you know, bartenders being out of work, chefs being out of work and, um, you know, places uh, like established restaurants kind of going out of business. And, but on the other side, what's been amazing is seeing the creativity that um, the industry and people as a whole have kind of brought to this to try and, you know, make ends meet or you know survive during this time and so kind of seeing the creativity of these amazing beautiful outdoor seating um you know on on the side of the street or the pop-up restaurants that people are doing in farms or in parks and you know pairing these like super super high-end wines for takeout and the cocktails to go um and just chefs doing you know virtual virtual experience as well. My team and I just did um, a virtual event with the pastry chef from WS in New York, and we learned how to make macaroons. And um, it was, you know, they're probably not what they wanted to be doing. They probably wanted to be in their kitchen and um, cooking for the masses. But, you know, I think that it's in these times that people get creative and that trends form from this that don't go away. So I think once we do get back to eating inside, I think that people are going to start to, they're going to still want to be able to take their bottle of wine to go or get that same Amakasi um, experience to go and eat at their own home. So I don't see that going away. And I think that, you know, now's the, now are those times that people can be super innovative and, um, you know, cut through the clutter to do something pretty cool. Yep. Very cool. I imagine everyone would, would want to work, all, all the pastry chefs out there would want to work with you. Um, it's such such a fantastic brand. Uh, so this will be my last question. I see Lauren coming back. But um, what do you look for in a partnership? Like what what makes uh, what makes is it having a kind of same audience or what what is um, like you know with with all the things that that I think want to associate with your brand? How do you decide uh, in, in you know pick and choose what what partnerships make sense? I think that um, most importantly, I look for. A team of people that, um, you know, we can start to build a trusted relationship. And I think that that's the forefront of um, all of the partnerships is 
it becomes a friendship. You know, it's people that I want to work with. It's people that I end up talking to, you know, every week, sometimes every other day. And it's not just a, you know, we're going to sign a contract and then, you know, you have to deliver X, Y, Z. I have to deliver X, Y, Z. It's really finding people that um, want to go above and beyond. And I want to go above and beyond for them. And it's like finding solutions together of how I can be the best asset to them. Maybe it's just simplifying their path to purchase or maybe it's like creating experiences for their clientele. Um, I try not to be like very rigid of how I'm gonna work with these people because I want it to be custom and tailored depending on what their needs are. And so it's not a one size fits all, which is why I think our team is like super nimble and we're able to create these really long-standing partnerships because it's, you know, they're symbiotic relationships. There's no exclusivity. They can work with anybody they want, but they want to work with us because we're there for them when they need us. Yep. Awesome. Those are the best <laughs> partnerships for sure. And um, I want to thank you for, for your partnership. I've done a lot of these, uh, um, been, been part of a few brand innovators events. And I think this is the first one I've done where it's with a, a lab partner too. Um, so it's, it's so cool that, that we can make this happen. And uh, thanks, thanks again, Kate, and and thanks, Lauren, for for getting us set up. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Casey. Now I know why Casey was so excited when I I asked her if he wanted to do this. <laughs> it's like, yes, That's I'll it. do it. <laughs> yeah, it was perfect. Match made in heaven. Well, thank you guys both so much for being here today. We hope you'll come back again soon. We're doing um, programming. Gosh, we're planning now out through October and November. So. Um, you know, let us know if you want to come back. We'd love to have you. And next time we'll have cocktails. Yeah, I love that. Let's do it. Sounds okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you guys. So Thanks, much. Lawrence. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you to everybody who tuned in today. Um, it was a nice, short and sweet program. And um,